Welcome to Mainland, your local regional television station. I'm Graham O'Brien and some of the stories coming up in today's news. The Sallies see family demand rise, cost of protection too much for some, we examine Nelson's homeless situation and more. Domestic violence levels are growing nationally with an ever increasing tally of protection orders being granted. Looking back to 2010 figures, we see a steady increase from 2,772 from that year through to 2,914 for 2013 and 3,307 in latest figures of protection orders for 2014 period. Nelson Police spokesman told Mainland News that the figures of reported domestic violence do not reflect accurately the amount of cases. Police are aware that many go unreported due to fear of reprisal. However, police have a network of organisations that can help not only the victims of abuse but the perpetrators to help them deal with the issues. No figures for locally reported cases were available from police at the time of inquiry. Meanwhile, Nelson Women's Refuge is not seeing any decrease in the instances of domestic violence in our region. This charitable organisation continues to be as busy as ever with families and women seeking shelter from abuse. Women's Refuge are also seeing women who have not approached police and who find the cost of legal help of $500 or more for legal assistance prohibitive. Costs can also go a lot higher if the protection order is defended. While a protection order can be applied for without a lawyer, Women's Refuge do not advise this course of action. They have found in some instances that women aren't always able to get protection orders or have good decisions made about the care of their children if they apply without a lawyer. Figures provided by the New Zealand Law Society show that during the two years of 30th of April 2015, there were 6,957 people who applied for legal aid nationally for the purpose of obtaining a protection order. Associate Justice Minister Simon Bridges revealed in a response to a series of parliamentary questions that 351 people, equating to 5% of the total applications, were refused legal aid to obtain a protection order in the two years to 30th of April 2015. Nelson Women's Refuge has said it has had very good support from the lawyers they work with in applying for legal aid help, wherever possible. However, with a cost of at least $500, it is an enormous obstacle for women applying for a protection order, and in some cases, likely to prevent them from continuing with the process. Women's Refuge manager for Nelson, Katie O'Donnell, said she would prefer there were no fees for applying for protection orders. Meanwhile, funding is always a big issue for the Women's Refuge in Nelson, despite the wonderful support they get from the Nelson community. Katie said that in November they will partner with the car company who will be making a donation to Nelson Women's Refuge for every car sold that month, while volunteers will be out on the street collecting donations to help the refuge to continue providing its support service. We know that many triggers can increase the possibility of stress in the home, forcing people to seek help and one of these is usually economics. This week I caught up with Nelson Salvation Army Captain Kevin War, who was Community Ministries Officer for Nelson, and asked if there's been an increase in people requiring assistance. Captain Kevin War, thanks for spending a couple of minutes to talk with us today. Are you finding there's an increased demand for Salvation Army services in the region? Um, at the moment I think it's um, about the same as last year, but there is a demand, a more of a demand for budgeting, um, which is because the money is just not going as far, um, particularly around the housing. Um, rentals are quite expensive. If they're on a benefit, it doesn't stretch. And then there's a need because they can't buy the food or they can't buy, pay for power or you know the essentials. So we're getting a lot more for that sort of thing. Right, and there, there seems to be a growing number of homeless in Nelson. Um, do you provide for these people as well through Salvation Army? Uh, we don't have any emergency housing at all here in Nelson. We have to use what's in the community. And so for the men, they, there's a men's shelter, but that's limited by space. Now for the women, there is actually no, uh, as I understand, emergency housing. And so it's a matter of hunting around what is available, where can we get them, and sometimes it's, it's very, very hard to find. Yeah. Yeah, that's surprising to hear, is it? And also the men's shelter has a time limit on it, I understand, do you know? Um, 
I think there's a, yeah, a, a week or so at the most. Um, but yeah, they're easier to find somewhere um, to to house overnight and then try and work with them to get somewhere better. Yeah. Sure, and as we know, the, the women are more vulnerable where they can't just kip out maybe under a bridge like the men can. No, a lot of, a lot of the women that would come in here have children as well, and that makes another part of that, trying to find uh, accommodation. Yeah. It's a sad fact of our society at the moment. Um, can you give us just a general rundown of what services you do provide for us in the community? Okay, well, we, we get people coming in seeking food assistance, um, budgeting. Um, we can do some counselling. We've got counsellors and we've got social worker. Um, advocate for people. We'll go with them to work and income or whatever service they're trying to deal with and they're not understanding what that group's saying. So a lot of the time it's just being there and they explain their story and we just fine-tune it a little bit so they, that the whoever they're talking to... Um, understands where they're coming from. Oh, that's great. Yeah, that's more that's more of a, a support role in, in making sure people know what's going on and what they're entitled to. Yeah, we yeah. There's a lot of people that just don't understand what's been asked of them, and they get confused, and then they can get a little hot under the collar sometimes. Um, uh, we'll, we'll be an agent for a person that maybe has been barred from working income, you know, for various reasons, and of course. They're a little bit more sensitive today with the issues that have happened around the country. So they're very, very security conscious, you know, for their staff. So we, we try and work with everybody to, to get the best income uh, outcome for them. Yeah, I mean, that's, a, that's a very interesting point that you make, you know, the, that people sometimes can't go to Windsor anymore because of something that's happened before. I mean, what have happened to those people? And also that, that people are not quite understanding the bureaucracy of it all. Yeah, it gets quite confusing for for some people. Uh, what's you know the paperwork? We'll get people coming in here and we'll help them through writing out what they need to do. And then um, yeah, if they've unfortunately been I say trespassed, then they have to sit here and we 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 become their agent. Or you know, there's other agencies out here that do the same thing. But uh, we're just one of many trying to help people get back on their feet. Yeah, that's great, and and we and everyone really appreciates the services that Salvation Army provides, and the other community organisations. Do you feel that there's a, a different group of people coming for help, or are we, are we still looking at the same kind of people that we always envisioned being in having trouble in in society? Um, I don't think it's changed at all. I think that maybe we have more um, single mums uh, with their children. And that could be a little bit higher, but on the whole, it comes in, in waves. Yeah, and I think that's dependent on the seasonal work that people can get around Nelson, you know, in the district. And when, so, when people have got work, then they've got income. When that falls over or, or it stops, then there's a demand, and we have to meet, try and meet that. Sure, and, and any kind of emergency always puts people down and, and under their normal position isn't it? Yeah they they can't see that little that light at the end of the tunnel they just see this mess that's there and so it's working with them to get through that yeah. Great Captain Kim Ward thanks very much for your comments and your time. There seems to be a noticeable increase in people in the city who are asking for donations to survive. I went out to the street in Nelson to ask someone who Nelsonians are well acquainted with about the situation of the homeless in Nelson. Honey, you know what it's like to be on the streets, you know the dangers of living on the streets. At the moment, do you feel there's an increase in homeless people in Nelson? Um, I don't think there's an increase in, in homelessness. It's more to the point that there's, there's more people becoming aware of it. Uh, and a lot of those people that are living on the streets um, and don't want to uh, have their identities known about or, or front up about it uh, because of the implications that it may cause, like uh, the council doing things uh, to try and kick them out, um, or welfare, some people that are um, on welfare um, that are living on the street, they have to depend on that welfare. Uh, so you also got to look at the amount of people that are 
um, at, the, at the men's night shelter, for instance, because they're all considered to be homeless as well. This week we hear from Councillor Eric Davies on Council's role in this Southern Link review process. Councillor Eric Davies, thanks very much for coming in today. My pleasure. Um, you were the chair of the Regional Transport Committee the other day. Um, at, there was a very full public gallery and a very full public forum about the, the Southern Link. Um, I, I think I was surprised and I think a number of people were surprised at um, your comments and Council's position in this process yep. and if you could please could you please outline um, your comments and, and council's position no problem what started um, the regional transport committee public forum was the fact that we had been asked by a number of people if they could come along and speak to council in relation to the southern link people are aware that uh, an investigation had been started and uh, so myself and the mayor decided that the appropriate place was the Regional Transport Committee um, because we control the strategic direction of our, our, our traffic. So uh, like you said, I was surprised too at the number of people <laughs> who are in the public gallery. Um, but then the, uh, there were four speakers that uh, had permission to speak and uh, they were very eloquent in what they said. Um, but at the end, uh, and some questions were raised by, by one of them, but at the end, I had to make the statement that this was not, this investigation was not initiated by Nelson City Council. This investigation was initiated by central government, by cabinet. Cabinet ruled that this will be one of 14, uh, what they call accelerated projects yep. in relation to roading, um, to try and look after the economic developments of the regions. So they uh, commenced the investigation back last year. We do not get involved in this at this time because they're actually conducting an investigation and there's th always three parts to it. Um, they, they do the investigation, gather all the information uh, statistically and factually, then they analyse that and then they come out to the community and that's when we will actually become um, involved where council will be asked for their views the community we ask their views um, all aspects of the community will be asked it's a very wide-ranging very detailed investigation that is being undertaken i made the comment uh, at the start of the year that regardless of the outcome this process must not show any um, any bias by anybody. In other words, uh, to be treated absolutely impartially. And so I made that very clear to uh, Wellington that we wanted the following to occur, which was that it be absolutely impartial, that an outside consultancy firm of Nelson from Nelson um, is used to do the investigation and so a consultancy firm from Wellington has been engaged by NZTA yep. to do the work and so we're we're waiting to hear like everybody else the results of the investigation um, there are little snippets that we've heard but uh, at the moment there is nothing at all that we can say infer um, or comment on. And I understand that Council has has written to the NZTA in regards to this process? I think that you say without a predetermined view? Oh yes, yes, yes. yes. Um, I, I wrote on behalf of the Regional Transport Committee to the NZTA that uh, it, it is to be a impartial process uh, for credibility of the investigation if you like. As you are well aware, this is a controversial subject. And so we want the investigation to be absolutely squeaky clean. We don't want anybody to come back to us and say, oh, you had undue influence on this, or that group had undue influence, or, or the likes. Yeah. And so Nelson City Council, up to this time, have had, uh, are not involved in the investigation phase. And, and just to clear it up, this isn't a process is it, that is unusual, this isn't a process that that you would call different in any way? Well, it's slightly different to the normal process that NZTA run. 
because um, there are there are 14 projects, as I mentioned earlier, that are under the accelerated program, and there's just one of those. So the process is no different to the other 13 projects that are mm -hmm. going on at the same time. Four of those are in the top of the South Island, oh. and um, their investigations are car being carried out on on them all. Mm. Isn't, thanks very much, Councillor yeah. Eric Davies. I think that clear. That, I hope that cleared it up for a lot of people, and it certainly yeah. makes um, it certainly makes it a lot clearer where our council's role is in this in this process. Yes. Because, um, like I say, it was very surprised. Everyone went there thinking that they were having a say to council to to ha to have some sort of um, yep. angle on the, on proceedings, but in fact, as you pointed out, at this point in time, it's not our project. Yeah. It's a central government project. The final decision uh, in relation to the complete investigation will be made at cabinet level, and so uh, we have no say. It's a state highway. Um, the central government will be funding it. Um, hopefully, we'll be funding it <laughs> all. Uh, if if it goes ahead, yeah. Um, but yeah, we're we're just making sure that everybody knows where we stand because we can't stand on anywhere. At the moment, yeah. And, and, there, and there's, still a, there's still a part there, there's still a process there where there's public consultation, oh. everyone gets yeah. to have a say, they get, the, yep. once again, we'll, we, we'll have speakers and, you know, oh. and they'll be able to put their cases. Look, there'll be community groups, there'll be um, uh, communities of interest uh, who will all be involved. There'll be uh, wide ranging uh, uh, areas like the Automobile Association, Road Transport Association, um, AC, all these people will be involved yeah. uh, and will all be consulted. It's not a fly-by-night process, it's a very long process. Is, is there any time frame that you know of on, on, this, on this process? I think if you go to the NZTA website right now, you'll find that there is a time frame in there okay. that they've laid down for the Southern Link investigation but they hope to have it back to Cabinet uh, sometime uh, next year. Yeah, well, we're, we're waiting to hear from NZTA whether they yep. will come on and, and have and, and tell us a bit more about the process mm. and their, and their yep. side of it, so we'll, yep. we'll wait to see if we can yep. hear from them. I can, uh, there, there is a, a document on the NZTA website which details the process. Okay, I'm yep. sure if people so are interested, they'll be able to go. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Excellent, right. thanks very much. Not a problem, my Thank pleasure. You. It seems that the fluoride debate has touched a raw nerve with some in our community. I asked Sarah Cooper to fill us in on the latest details. Sarah, since we last talked to you, seems to be a bit of controversy around the fluoride issue. Can you give us a bit of an update on what's been going on, please? Um, I guess it's a little bit of controversy, not intended. Um, we... Okay, so after the first meeting, the first public meeting, the Nelson Marlborough District Health Board uh, made it quite clear that they're really um, keen to engage with the public. And so after the um, interview, um, went away and talked with a few people and we've cr um, generated a meeting. And so we created a booking with the Victory Community Centre, or we created a booking with the Victory Community Centre in, um, for the 28th of November. Um, so, and I wanted to extend an invitation to the DHB, so I called to talk with Jenny, um, whom I'd spoken with afterwards, and it was really clear that she wanted to catch up at a later date. So, called to talk to her and invite the DHB and everyone to the meeting so that the public could have many different perspectives on this topic because it's really vital that um, something that we're going to be drinking, consuming, washing in, um, that's going to be affected by this decision is known, you know, all sides are known. So um, didn't get a response from the phone call so um, the, the last meeting, the last public meeting I thought well I'll go to this and give them a flyer to invite everyone and um, listen to the meeting again and so I did this and um, talked to the DHB and the public that were there and um, was received really really well so um, and it felt really good because um, they repeated that they wanted to engage with the public and um, then following that getting home and um, later early this week um, after the weekend got a phone call from Victory Community Centre saying that they wanted to cancel our booking because their position is not fluoride free, their position is that they see that it's 
vastly beneficial to um, fluoridate our water. So that's worrying for me. And all, all you're trying to do is present two sides of the story. Is this, this yeah. is the idea? Yeah, um, definitely. I mean, pretty much. I mean, I am very keen on choices. Keep our choices open. You know, and fluoridating our water is not keeping our choices open. Do you not feel that the DHB has looked at both sides of this, both sides of this issue and they're presenting their side? Well, it's interesting that you ask that because um, one of our members has um, asked for information on their meetings and the information that was presented, so under the Official Information Act, and they sent the minutes pertaining to this decision and reading through it, there is only one perspective that has been shown throughout. I mean, the science is increasingly against fluoridating water globally. 98% of Europe does not fluoridate, and the reason for that is they want to keep their water safe. That's their mandate. Okay, so um, you're having a meeting on the November the 28th. Who have you got coming down to, to talk to the public? Okay, we've got Mary Byrne from Fluoride Free New Zealand, and we've got Dr Littress. Um, and we've also got people talking, uh, speaking about child smile, which um, Scotland has never fluoridated their teeth. The children, the, they worried about their te children's teeth, and um, started a program called Child Smile in 2005 thereabouts. And their teeth, the quality of their children's teeth, and other issues have improved remarkably, and they're much better than New Zealand's children's teeth today. Yeah. So you're not just saying we don't want fluoride, you're trying to put forward an alternative. Oh yeah, definitely. Keep our choices open to us as families and parents and whatever, and look after the teeth, definitely, but do it in a healthful way. Thanks very much, Sarah. Thank you. The Victory Community Centre Director, Kendra Douglas, said that the decision to pull the fluoride meeting was a decision of Dr John Moore as Head of the Board of Trustees, saying that the Board does not agree with the fluoride-free stance. The community meeting being held by Fluoride Free Nelson is now at Fairfield House, Saturday November the 28th from 1 till 3pm. For more details, please go to the links provided. It was not the way that Kieran King wanted to leave the Marcos after their season has come to a grinding end after their semi-final loss to Auckland. However, as King leaves to join the Chiefs coaching team after seven seasons with Tasman Marcos and six as head coach, he should be proud of taking the team to the top of their game and into the Premiership League ITM Cup. Mainland TV wishes him well in his future position. After the break, we'll bring you the latest weather update and some events and happenings coming up from around the region. Hi everyone, I'm Malcolm Harris from The Facilitators. We now look after sales for mainland TV, radio, sky and online. New Zealand On Air's latest Colmar Brunton survey confirms mainland's large multimedia audience. If you're in business or want to put a message out to everyone in the Nelson Tasman region, plus nationwide on sky or worldwide online, please give me a call or see our website at www.mainlandtv.nz. We're the team at JCAR, right here in Nelson, 120 Hardy Street. Our shop is full of electronic items, including security alarm systems, electronic components, solar and power, electronics toys, sound systems, cables and much, much more. Jacob. 120 Hardy Street, Nelson. I'm Francis from Nelson Auto Glass. We repair all auto glass, stone chips, windscreen replacements, scratch removal. If you have an auto glass issue, our team will sort it. Nelson Auto Glass Specialist, 84 Vanguard Street, Nelson. Eighty-eight point one, the shed.
Sit and Be Fit is on at the Victory Community Centre Tuesdays and Thursdays at 10am at the Victory Community Church, 238 Upper Vanguard Street. School terms only. Fun while you get fitter, work at your level. For more information, please contact Shirley on 547 1433 or 021 121 8023. Victory 60 Plus is on Tuesdays at 1.30 through to 3.30pm at 238 Upper Vanguard Street. You can join in for cards, games and a cuppa. On behalf of the team here at Mainland Television News, thank you for joining us and we'll bring you the latest news and events from around the region again tomorrow. Supporting local content so you can see more of New Zealand on air. Are you tired of endless reality shows? Would you prefer to watch captivating documentaries? They have swallowed cars. Exciting movies. Go ahead, load up and shoot. Music for the soul. And you think I ate your fish and chips? I did, you're mistaken. Programming from around the world. places to visit. Local news and views. I'm Graham O'Brien and today's bulletin. Do you want to change the flag? No, nah, I, don't, I don't want to change the flag. Stay tuned to Mainland TV, your local station. Welcome to Smuggler's Pub and Cafe, open seven days a week with free parking all day. Our lunch menus have that fat old-fashioned flavour where we treat you like treasure with the food you'll savour. We cater for children, grannies and granddads too, with special rates and privileges given to the elderly lunchtime crew. Our staff are friendly and kind and want to see you all come back time after time. Daytime or evening, it doesn't matter. Give us a call on 546-4084 and we'll be happy to spoil ya. Edward Gibbon, the bathroom specialists, have a great range of bathroom ideas at their showroom at 23 McGlashan Ave in Richmond. Call in and check out some of the latest bathroom designs and fittings. Edward Gibbon, the bathroom plumbing and drainage supply specialists, 23 McGlashan Ave, Richmond. Why would you want to pay as much as $1,000 for a single bed mattress when you can buy a high quality locally made mattress like this for as little as $220? And a queen size mattress could cost you in excess of $3,000, but at Nelson Beds you could have a mattress like this as low as $425. So why would you go out and spend a fortune on your child's bedroom when you can come to Nelson Beds and buy a complete single mattress and base set, a 7 drawer scotch chest, a headboard and a 3 drawer bedside cabinet for as little as $979? So call and discuss our custom manufacturing options and local after-sales service at Nelson Beds, Nelson's only bedding manufacturer. Nelson Tire Center. Great prices, great service. Buy your own Bryford trailer. All types, all sizes. See Colin Douglas for your tires and batteries. Why would you want to pay as much as $1,000 for a single bed mattress when you can buy a high quality locally made mattress like this for as little as $220? And a queen size mattress could cost you in excess of $3,000, but at Nelson Beds you could have a mattress like this as low as $425. So why would you go out and spend a fortune on your child's bedroom when you can come to Nelson Beds and buy a complete single mattress and base set, a 7 drawer scotch chest, a headboard and a 3 drawer bedside cabinet for as little as $979? So call and discuss our custom manufacturing options and local after-sales service at Nelson Beds, Nelson's only bedding manufacturer.